Hello and welcome back to Voice of Geekdom. I'm your host Dan and today I've got a very special panel of guests on to discuss the Amazon Prime adaptation of The Lord of the Rings. To my right is Dr. Maggie Park who is a consultant in Welsh universities and lectures with Signum University on Tolkien. Um, Dr. Park also works with um, with uh, the film industry extensively as a consultant and has experience working in, with various fandoms, developing fan relationships with um, adaptations of various different franchises. Um, below Dr. Park, we've got Mariana Rios Maldonado. Um, hopefully I've got that name right. <laughs> and Mariana is a PhD candidate for the University of Glasgow, uh, studying under Dr. Dimitra Fimi, um, the renowned Tolkien scholar, and and your research is on ethics, femininity, and the other, is that right? Yes, yes, that's correct. You you also, you're uh, the, you're on the editorial board for, for Malon Journal, um, I believe, yes. right? Um, I'm, part, um, I'm part of the um, editorial board for the peer-reviewed journal Malern, which is part of the Tolkien Society. And mm -hmm. I'm also the Equality and Diversity Officer for the Center for Fantasy and the Fantastic at the University of Glasgow. So, much more qualified than me to speak about today's topic, I think. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm very excited to have both of you on. And below me is uh, my friend Harry from Fellowship of Fans. Um, the disembodied voice with the the map and the sword below me. Um, <laughs> Harry, uh, for those who don't know, I am uh, here. Hello, <laughs> <laughs> covers the the Amazon Prime show fairly fairly exclusively. I mean, you do bits of lore as well, but you you you've um, been covering news and views on the Amazon Prime mm -hmm. in detail on your channel. Um, and yeah, most we'll get into we'll get into some of your experiences covering that as we as we get into this. Um, but yeah, thank you all for coming on. And um, I wanted to start out by just getting kind of your your hot takes and your kind of thoughts and high level opinions on what we've seen from Amazon Prime so far and what, what are our hopes and fears for this adaptation. So I'm going to pass the buck to Maggie, first of all, and just get your opinion on what we've seen. Ooh, that's a big question. I'll try to be concise. Um, there's a couple things. For one thing, I'm not a Tolkien scholar. I've always been a student of Tolkien and I'm very engaged with it, but these guys are probably going to know a lot more about, you know, the history of Middle Earth and the, the details. I'm very much more practical based. Um, and I definitely did a lot of case study work on the, the Peter Jackson adaptations. Um, so there's, there's engagement there. Um, but I think so like, so that being said, I think my, my expertise and my interest comes from the actual production practices and how they're showing us that they're taking care of this material. If they're taking care of this material, they're not showing us a lot about their care of the material. And that makes me a little concerned, but I'm hoping it's just because they're being a bit private about their practice and their process. Um, but there hasn't been much to see yet. The announcements that they've made have been very corporate. They've been very dry. Um, there's not been a lot of pomp and circumstance. It's a little bit more factual, um, which is fine, but they do know who they're dealing with. So you would hope there'd be a little bit more engagement with the fandom and a little bit more enthusiasm. Um, when the first trailer came out, I don't know if you guys remember that. Was it, I think it was late 2017 where they showed, you know, people wearing Hobbit slippers in the office and they panned in on the expertise and the shows that they've done before. And Tom Shippey was really mm -hmm. highlighted. Mm -hmm. That to me was just calming the fans and saying, we're taking care of this. We care. We're really engaged. And I just haven't seen anything like that since that trailer. And we know there's been a lot of staff changes since then. So yes. I'm concerned. Um, but what we have also seen doesn't doesn't really worry me. So like the lack of information worries me, but what we've seen, Cat looks great. I mean, mm -hmm. the showrunners don't have a ton of experience. I wish there was a little bit more statement from them about their engagement with the material and their own statement of being a fan of, of these works, you know, just something that calmed us a little bit as, as a fandom. Um, but you know, what we're seeing I think is also okay. And the fact that from top down, everybody's been involved in this deal you know how much is invested financially and personally that i imagine every care is being taken i just wish we could hear a little bit more about it so i'm on the fence i'm excited i'm yeah. cautiously optimistic 
what do, what, do you think, what do you think is the reason for the lack of information? Because we, we, that's definitely noticeable that we just don't seem to actually know much. Um, one of the things I was talking to about your colleague, Dr. Olson, uh, a couple of weeks ago was just um, kind of exactly this, really, like uh, the hopes and fears that we have for this adaptation. But if there's, there is very little to go on. Um, why, why are they being so secretive and, and why aren't they engaging more? Yeah, and when you do a lot of research, there's just not a lot out there. There's not a lot of new information. It's a lot of sources re-saying the same sentences that have been out for months. I imagine that is to protect what they have. I mean, I don't even think they've announced the actual names of the characters some of these actors are playing. I think they're throwing us through a loop to really contain the story. So when it launches, it's going to be a big deal. So there's no room for speculation. The issue with that is that now we're speculating about all the wrong stuff. You know, the amount of speculation about the nudity and, and sex that I know we're going to talk about mm. is so overshadowing anything else that this series could have us talking about. Yeah. So I'm a little frustrated with that. Um, I imagine it's just a protection thing. I mean, when you hear stories about their writer's room, it's a fingerprint access. There's, you know, a list of the people that are in and out of that room. They're really protecting that IP, that material. So I assume it's just batten down the hatches we don't want anything leaked but to me that's also a detriment pick the thing you want to leak pick a tiny thing to leak and use it to your advantage like you can control the message but they haven't done that for us yet no and mariana uh, what, what are your thoughts on, on a high on a very high level about the show um so I'm actually going to go maybe in an opposite direction to what your Dr. Park said, um, just because I don't necessarily have any experience in the world of media or film. I'm a scholar. Mm -hmm. So for me personally, and um, having grown up with the Peter Jackson films, I believe that this is a new opportunity to basically have a clean slate and it's a reinterpretation of Tolkien's works for the fandom of the 20th century, mm -hmm. 20th and 21st century. And for me, it's actually an advantage, the fact that we don't know that much and there's nothing actually being leaked because this opens up opportunity for, like I said, new perspectives and new ideas to come and for the show to really wow us when it finally arrives. Um, I'm not the type of person that is quite interested in spoilers, I have to admit. So the few information that we have is, for example, on the website, we have multiple maps of apparently the areas mm. that they're going to focus on. And this is something super interesting because the names on the maps correspond to, for example, the ancient Elvish de denominations of Middle Earth. So that already gives us a perspective of when this story yeah. is going to be situated, which makes it very interesting. And then at the same time, for example, thinking about the role of diversity, one of the few mentions that we have in the maps is, for example, um, the region of Harad or Umba. Yes, and that's true. we already, like, where will that narrative take us? And will these, let's say, peoples also be given a voice? Things that we hadn't seen before. So I think mm -hmm. it's very excited to give those, let's say, little hints. At the same time, seeing the video that is um, that was posted on, on Facebook and on Twitter about basically the staff that was writing, I'm also very happy to see. I know that there have been changes. But, for example, there is people of color on the writing staff and the ratio the gender ratio seems to be quite leveled so that also mm -hmm. makes me very optimistic at the same time you have a scholar such as tom shippey who has been fundamental for the study of tolkien scholarship in the past let's say 20 30 years and that gives me a reason to believe that there will be certain aspects taken care of. I'm very also cautious about saying if a work will remain true to the spirit of an author or not, because at the end of the day, Tolkien died in the 70s, and mm -hmm. all we have left from him are some of his essays and his letters and interviews. We don't necessarily know the full extent of his authorial intention, and we don't necessarily know how he would react to the world that we are in today. 
So it's up to us, you know, to mm -hmm. basically step our game up and see how his works can respond through the world that they created to the challenges of today. And for me, it's much more important to create that sort of anticipation as to necessarily give us hints and clues as to how loyal it would be because loyalty, how do we interpret loyalty to a certain material or to a certain spirit? Especially yeah. thinking about the complex and diverse scenarios that these works are responding to right now in the 21st century. And that actually ties in nicely with something I've heard you say before, Maggie, which is um, that you're not keen on this idea of like um, sort of faithfulness to a, to a, um, an adapted work. Um, yeah, I'm a big proponent of, of making the media work for the story that absolutely with something like Tolkien, you need to be in the spirit of. But like you said, Mariana, like who are we to say? I mean, we have Tolkien estate to make sure we have continuity of, of quality and things like that. Um, but in terms of the story that needs to be told, yeah, I'm so excited that it can change with the time. And just like you said, that there's a diverse background and that we have not a word for word translation. We're not looking at the Fellowship of the Ring and turning that book into a film. We're right. having a general gist of ideas and maybe a timeline and a map and an area. And we know kind of the outcome of what happened in that time. That's what we get to create. So there's a lot more creative freedom. And that's super exciting, which is why I imagine they're protecting the IP that they don't want to let that out because it's it's all new and they don't want you to get pissed off about you know this new character that they've invented because it doesn't exist in the book but you're allowed to do that you're allowed to invent characters to fill in gaps and to to bridge these these storylines that maybe don't work in the book could work on a film or we don't have enough information in the text but we can make it work in a visual medium so yeah i'm all for adaptation having that fluidity yeah and i think that that also responds quite nicely to well if for Tolkien geeks and those who like, you know, they're like in the text, um, some of you might recognize the prologue to the second edition of the Lord of the Rings, where basically Tolkien goes on this whole exploration of what he considers to be applicability, applicability versus a one-to-one -one interpretation of his text as an allegory. And this is a big thing in Tolkien scholarship, because basically what Tolkien is saying is, I want my work to be applicable to the backgrounds and the stories of all of my readers. And so I think that this is a perfect example of precisely, you know, having that opportunity as opposed to, let's say, a very theological perspective of this is the way that these works should be read and should be portrayed and should be seen. Because we're talking right now of a readership that has transcended generations, languages, ethnicities, uh, political contexts, um, cultures. And I think it's very interesting to see how basically we can address that sort of multifariousness and remembering how, how precisely Tolkien himself, you know, highlighted this idea of, I want my works to be applicable. Mm -hmm. And, um, and Harry, uh, Fellowship of Fans, yeah, your hopes and fears for the Amazon Prime <laughs> adaptation. So from a YouTuber standpoint, one thing I want most is interaction with the fans. And of course, I'm not sure everyone, everyone wants that as well. But the, the, the only fear, well, one of the many fears I have right now is the fact that we knew about the show 2017, end of 2017. And 2018, that is fine. It's fair enough. We're going to have to wait a while. It's still in pre-production. 2019, we're starting to get there a bit. We maybe have a little bit of fan interaction. Then we go into 2020. And then, for example, for on their Twitter accounts and all social media accounts, having six months of not even interacting or saying any little things. Because if I was head of PR, if I was wanting to, I was head of fan interact with the show, because I know Amazon do have a specific person for fan interact with the show. I'm not sure what job they're doing right now. Maybe they're on furlough or something, but they're not doing their job right now. But the thing that I would like to say is maybe it's have a little fan interaction, because if you remember, I believe it was in September, October, it was, it was Hobbit Day, I believe. And we could have had a little interaction in there. Maybe do some things that maybe some of the Reddit steward everybody posts a, a section of what they like most from the hobby or something like that etc just these small fan interactions early to show yes 
we Lord of the Rings on Prime, we are here with the fans as well. We know this show is going to be big, but we do want to also please our core audience. And of course, we don't know how far off the show is right now because they are currently on a pre-production. So maybe we're still another year or half off. Maybe they're trying to delay it a bit. But the, my main fear right now and is mainly um, just seeing these little just maybe little interactions with fans would be great. And of course, I think, believe we're going to be talking about later, for example, nudity and how that's going to, that's a massive fear for a lot of people. And of course, with some of those fears, there's not a lot of evidence, for example, to back it up. But what there clearly is evidence of is the lack of interaction with the fans. I know, I know that with how much the One Ring Net go on about it, even though they, even though they have had the things retweeted, but they still, there's still not that little interaction that I believe is important. Because even if you see the Wheel on Time, Wheel of yeah, Wheel of Time Twitter account, there's there's small interaction with the fans. That even their showrunner is hosting Q and As, and I reached out to JD Payne and Patrick McKay, but they seem everyone I believe in production seems a bit too reserved. And maybe in in two months, three months, this will. I'll probably have none of these fears, but just my initial fears at the moment. Hmm. Okay, good. Um, yes, and I, I certainly agree with that. And it's and it's odd actually, really, because uh, the other show that on, is on Amazon Prime that I follow very closely is The Expanse, and they're they're fantastic at it. They're really good um, at interacting with fans and and building up a kind of fandom around that property. Um, Which makes that, me think there's a real lockdown on communication around it. But exactly as Harry said, like you, you can share something. You could absolutely say we're not sharing anything about our production details. You will not know characters or mm -hmm. scripts. You could tell us that, mm -hmm. and then say, but we'll talk to you about you know filming in New Zealand and what it's like because we know that. So mm -hmm. you know you could find your route to talk about something, and there's just not there's just not been any of that. No. I yeah. I also wonder to what extent this might have to do with the question of rights um and mm. the the like how contractually that is being perceived i'm not an expert on this but only for example from knowing and basically working with tolkien material on a scholarly level i know that there is let's say a very cautious use of what material from the vast archives that there exist on tolkien because there is a lot a vast archive that can be and will be made accessible to the public. And let's not remember that, let's not forget, sorry, let's not forget that um, Christopher Tolkien died at the beginning of this year and he was basically the heir and the curator of all of this material. So I wonder to a certain extent how that also plays a role in the communications regarding the content of the series. like. I agree completely with you guys that one thing is the content and another thing is we're filming in New Zealand and sort of like maybe the day-to-day -day mm. aspects or um, the excitement, anything else that could be said on social media, but the nitty gritty about what the show is going to be about, the visual aspect, the storytelling. I wonder if that also responds to the historical attitude that the Tolkien estate has had regarding Tolkien's material. It's just a question, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we don't we don't quite know what they have uh, licensed for. So we don't we we have some educated guesses that we can make based on the maps, which mm -hmm. which you were just talking about before. Which I was talking about this with Corey a couple of weeks ago, which was that it's it, it would appear that they have some rights to the material in Unfinished Tales based on um the fact that Callan Arthon is on the map and Numenor uh, some of the place names in on the Numenorian map only appear in Unfinished Tales um mm. so the, the, that's rights that haven't actually been licensed in in previous adaptations which is encouraging I think um but we're just not getting anything more than what we've had now um and yeah that may play into a you know why they're being so so um secretive for sure um <clears throat> so um let's talk a little bit about the casting because um i know fellowship of fans you've been covering this in detail um yeah. and we've we, the one bit of information that we have had was from morfith clark did an interview um i think a couple of months ago now yeah, yeah. 
Um, and we did get bits of detail from her about the production and, and so on. Um, and she was mostly talking about how overwhelmed she was with the amount of detail that they're putting into the production um, and just the sheer cost of it, I think, <laughs> probably. Yeah. Um, what do we what do we think about the casting that we've got so far? Because, um, you know, we've got her, we've got her, and they seem to keep billing her as young Galadriel, which I always find really odd um, because she's, you know, five or 6,000 years old at this point, from what we know. Yeah. Younger. Um, well, younger, well, yeah. <laughs> what um, I can say about the casting of the show is I've known someone who's tried she's a properly uh, she's a all right actor okay that's a bit mean on her part she is a good actress of course but she she is still up and coming and she did try in london a few years ago try to apply for a role i think just mm -hmm. even a minor character in the lord of the rings on prime i believe that the actors they've chosen and as even i believe the show one has said on their statement a few months ago is a year years long search because she yeah. said she told me that there's one of the most hardest and longest auditions she's ever had to do because they found out that you you go one child then on normally in shows after you get past your first one you go into another one but there's like three or four stages before you can even get chosen it was the the amount tend to the length they went to try and find the perfect actors for specific roles i think is quite interesting i believe for the actors that we have seen so far i believe for each and there's a specific reason why each of them has been chosen because the amount of casting they have been doing over the last few years and the, it, was, it was actually quite vigorous as well it's the amount of stages because for a normal show say i know for example you were referencing the expanse earlier you'll probably have for this average actors you just have one casting then you have another another one then you'll probably meet the boss etc here in london it was one you have to go again, you have to go again. Now you have to please these people. You've pleased these people, these agencies. Now go again and please these other people. Then you can finally have a look in from the people higher up. So I believe the people who chosen are really lucky, but at the same time, they have gone for lots of local actors. And there's some people I did in my first video where I looked through the first five actors, three of them from New Zealand. One of them has never acted in a show or movie in his life. He just does stage theatre so and a lot of the people they've traced from new zealand are stage actors but one thing i'd like to say about that is that a few months ago some of the character descriptions were released and they had quote shakespearean quasi i'm sure um i think maggie or mariana can uh, go more in detail about that side of things but and they so i think they're looking for lots of more stage actors for extras as well but uh for overall for my opinion on the cost that i still believe we'll have four or five main actors still not announced yet and i know some people are saying russell crowe i don't know how he is going to be involved he i think or someone said to me before it looks like he's trying to audition for santa claus rather than rather than a role in tolkien but it's interesting but i believe maybe in the few in a few weeks or months you might see some videos of some more a-list actors hmm. i think we've got the main body of the cast here though and i think morpho clock and ishmael chris cordova and robert aramayo were are probably the three main actors from the initial cast that will go forward so yeah those are my opinions cool um yeah, and, and I think, yeah, that's absolutely right about the, how they've cast a wide net and it's, it appears to be a very sort of rigorous process. Um, I'm encouraged by Morthith Clark because mm -hmm. she's Welsh, which I think ought to help her with cinder in pronunciations, um, <laughs> in theory. Um, but, um, but yeah, that's, that's an, um, you know, a speculation on my part that that was, a, that was an element that they thought about. But... But yeah, I mean, there's, there's been quite a, a diverse cast. Um, mm -hmm. And as far as the fandom element there, um, there has been sort of a... There's been a slightly unsavory element of the fandom that has complained about this um, and seen it as... Be, I've seen it described as an attack on, on the source material. Um, I've seen all kinds of nonsense and misinformation come out of various different quarters about this issue. Um, we know from Tolkien's own writings, and Mariana will correct me if I'm wrong here, that he considered Gondor to be analogous to kind of the Mediterranean um, geographically, and Harad being sort of analogous to North Africa in some sense. Um, yeah, am I right about that? 
Yes. However, this situation is much more complex than one could see that one would necessarily deem from Tolkien's own declarations. And we go again towards the authorial intent. Um, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm very happy we're touching on this because, um, well, personally, I'm, I'm Mexican, so I'm a person of color. And to see somebody like Ismael Cruz Cordova being there and representing Latinos is something that really warms my heart. And also thinking about the possibilities of interpretation in the sense of, could we possibly reinterpret the peoples of Middle Earth also as something, um, as a diverse and rich world? Because there's two things. So one thing, and going back to authorial intention, and this is the argument that, as you said, a certain sector of fandom has espoused regarding um, the diversity of the cast, right? That the source material comes from uh, the medieval texts and cultures that inspired Tolkien. But I think that a very big misconception is to think that, um, that medieval England, for example, was racial, racially and ethnically homogenous. If you think about, for example, the contact that Germanic cultures had, and that later went over to England, and um, and also the Roman Empire, and how the Roman Empire was thought. There's not necessarily the same idea of racial purity that one would have um, post the Victorian era, and especially after World War II. So I think one has to be very careful treading that sort of line to say, well, to what extent am I um, is my being offended by the possibility of diverse cast not reflecting my own racial biases? So mm -hmm. I'm just going to have to say this quite bluntly, right? And the other thing is, for example, Tolkien does refer to his letters um, more or less about the geographic um, coordinates of where potentially his um, Middle Earth could be situated. And also the very famous letter of, he's trying to create a mythology for England. And what is that supposed to mean? This is a very complex issue. And in scholarship, there has been discussion after discussion for the past 20 years about, there's even essays entitled, what Tolkien really meant by that. But I think, and this is a personal perspective as a person of color, and a queer individual who studies Tolkien's text that I also believe that, you know, in the year 2020, what is the England for which he should, uh, he's trying to write his mythology for? And this is not denying um, his own personal history and his own cultural background and the historic biases that were in his society. And before you mentioned Dimitri Fimi, she has a wonderful book on race in Tolkien's Middle Earth that I heartily recommend to, to read and to understand where these ideas are coming from, you know? But I also would like to pose, it, it's a very complicated matter. And as you can see, I'm very passionate about this because I think that a lot of fans out there that are not Anglo-Saxon and white and European and English speaking are finally seeing themselves reflected in this story, you know? And what I would like to ask, and this is a question that I would like to pose to those sectors that feel, let's say threatened by the presence of people of color and a diverse cast in this new series. I would like to, what the question that I would like to ask is at the end of the day, the presence of these actors and individuals doesn't change the core tenets of the story. It doesn't change the themes. It still talks about death, about courage, about change, about hope. Mm -hmm. Why do you feel so threatened if the story is not changing? It says more about you as an audience than it says about the story. And I think that that's something we need to reflect on as fandom and as scholars and critics of Tolkien's works. That's just my spicy take of the day. 
<laughs> yeah, I, <laughs> I thought, thought that. Uh, here. <laughs> I thought a good way to summarize that is: Are you offended that there are people of color in the show due to your uh, due to your opinion of how Tolkien would have thought about it, or your own personal opinion? I think that's the two bridges, and because exactly. often, some people will say, because uh, even some some of my videos. And even on the accounts, there's difference between, okay, you might have an opinion, you might give your argument to why you don't believe people of colour should be in the show. But then at the same time, you just see poo emojis or you just see thumbs down emojis. And I think there's a difference between those type of people as well, that you do have some people who maybe potentially are opinionated on that. They do truly think that people of colour shouldn't be in the show. But then there's also some people who just just using that to fuel their own racism and agenda. And I believe that's what mariana is trying to um trying to say is that it's those type of people because you can have the person who writes their thing about talking you can also have the person who's just spamming five poo emojis under i don't know ismail's post for example and then that is there is a clear difference and of course it's not okay but it is online that is the online society we currently live in and i believe yeah. Unfortunately, we just have to deal with it and move forward. And maybe, and maybe that is why Amazon have not wanted to interact with the cost with with us. Who knows? Yeah, and, and also I, like, like, oh, please continue, Dr. Park. I was just going to say, I, I mean, my comment generally on casting is well done because there isn't anything that makes me go, oh, as soon as you mentioned Russell Crowe, I went, oh, that's that's not the reaction you want, you know, initially from someone. And this cast is, I don't want to say vague enough, but nobody's a, an A-lister, you know, hang the entire series on that name. And to me, that's a strength of story. You trust your story material and the quality of these actors to be able to perform the words that you have created and the world that you are envisioning on screen. That's excellent. So like, I'm already a little bit confident of like, ooh, a lot of stage experience, excellent, they can think on their feet, they're well practiced, you know, all of these things that come with being a stage actor, as well as not being an A-lister, it reminds me a little bit more of the Peter Jackson, you know, there were some that were obviously well known, but they weren't huge household names that they could kind of amalgamate together and become this fellowship, become this uh, mm -hmm. this cast. In terms of, of the uh, racial aspect of it, First of all, industry-wise, it's like trendy now to have colorblind casting. If you don't get on board with that, like there's something that you're not tapping into just in terms of industry trend. You know, we have Regency dramas coming out now, colorblind casting with Emma and Bridgerton and things like that. And they've been fantastic. Um, in terms of depicting in England mythology, exactly as Mariana said, why are we not changing with the times and depicting England that exists now? And mm. you're not ignoring the one that existed before. It just wasn't really highlighted and things that happened before. So to me, that makes sense to broaden the net quite a bit. In terms of negative fans reacting, oh my God, this is the world we live in. And mm. the only power we have is disengagement. You know, I'm not gonna pick a fight with these folks. I'm not gonna engage with them but maybe I'll release a statement about our ethics as a colorblind casting, or we did this kind of casting because we're really interested in diversity, showing the different worlds that could be represented in a world like Middle Earth. You know, there's different ways you can kind of combat the negative without singling out because that's, that's what feeds the fire. I don't want to single that out. That's not fun for anybody, but you know, engaging with it in a careful way could be more helpful. And I'm, yeah, all, I'm, doing also it. Saying that I'm also saying a more diverse Middle Earth, aside from a more really? diverse cast, because as we said before, it would appear that they've given some thought to portraying areas of the map that we haven't seen in great detail before, like Harad, like Kand and Umbar, areas that have always been, you know, um, part of the law, but we've never seen up close. And I, I'm really enthusiastic about seeing those on screen. Um, and having a diverse cast obviously makes sense for portraying that, I think. Um, I, also, I also think that we need to remember that we're speaking of fantasy. It's fantasy, it's speculative fiction, right? And if anything, fantasy media has the power of envisioning the world differently and also righting many wrongs. So if imagination and creativity are at the center of fantasy media, like this series and like this text, why can it also portray a world that is also not only just, but it's also rich and diverse? It should be. 
Yeah, and I believe that the big question right now, yes, people are complaining, but the big question is how is Amazon going to incorporate these these people of color actors into the show? And that I think would probably be probably be the boiling point for the hatred because right now, yeah, they're just involved. But say for example, if we see a black elf, for example, we've never seen that before, what would the reaction be? And of course, some people might get angry with that. Some people might get happy. We find that finally we are seeing more representation. But I believe the thing the problem Amazon have is that it's always going to be split 50-50. There's always going to be attacks on both sides. And it is really going to see how... how Because they don't want to going into their show to have so much controversy. Because already with the nudity rumors, rumors there's mm. controversy. And there's a little bit of controversy now with the thing. And they've they, they invested billion pounds into their show they spent 250 million on rights they this is this is their big this is amazon studios basically it's their baby this is what they want i believe that in a few years time we'll see another spin-off spin-off then in about 20 years time we'll see a tv series we make for the lord of the rings i think amazon studios are moving that way but if they want to go to the first show it depends how much controversy they want around the show because no matter what because we've never seen it middle earth before there's always going to be controversy around it and it depends on how they apply these people of color into the show which is going to be the main talking point and i personally think that what i think if i was amazon what i would do is we've seen numenor but it depends what time time of numenor is if it's is it after they've maybe colonized but then here comes the example of the people of color only in the come from colonized places that's a topic or discussion in itself why people of color only from colonized places by the numenorians they're mostly and say for example if numenorians are mostly white they're colonizing these people of people of color would that be a good idea for amazon to go through i it, it would in my opinion it wouldn't be because the controversy you get from that so i believe including maybe more people of color into numenor and establishing from there would actually probably be pretty good. And of course, if if they want to do uh, black or brown elves, that's fine as well. But it depends. I don't think they. It. I. I. I for me, I don't mind seeing it. But that's. But that's not the problem. It's not that I don't mind seeing it. Is I mean, elves are very rarely described in much detail, are they? I mean, the, and yeah. and there are black elves yeah. in in Peter Jackson's version. Just none of them are front and center. And why not? Yeah. You know, like the whole yeah. front cast doesn't need to be white and ethereal. I mean, yeah. Tolkien describes the eyes of elves in great detail, but very little else. <laughs> he, he'll tell you. He'll tell you all about like how how their eyes make you feel, and then he'll he'll pontificate on like the the metaphorical um element of how an elf will make you feel to look at like glorfindel is described as having wisdom on his brow etc what what does that mean visually it could mean anything um it's just it's more about how it makes you feel and that goes back to what mariana wonderfully said at the beginning which was that it's a matter of interpreting that for the modern world and for the audience that the amazon prime is is intended for which is for everybody I mean, I immediately think Idris Elba. So, hey, yeah, if you want to cast him as a lead elf, I'm fine with that. <laughs> For example, yeah, that... yeah like I I Idris Elba, he was Heimdall in yeah. the Thor movies, yeah. and it worked perfectly because he could embody that that character and that spirit. And I, I completely agree that. We, like even if you have people of color in the cast, you have to be very careful to not typecast them. This is also true. And there will be certainly issues and controversies that will come up. But at the same time, I think that this is important and this is necessary to have these discussions. I think that these are the type of um, questions and arguments that we must not shy away from anymore uh, because it's part of our world now and it's part of the media. Um, I'm not saying with this that every every single, um, you know, Tolkien inspired or, or Tolkien based media needs to have um, at its center any type of controversy or putting hi highlighting for example these societal problems and the reception and stuff like that but what i do think is that part of what makes tolkien so interesting and so important is that he makes us think think about these things right and 
about what a complex and rich and diverse universe really means. What does justice mean in this sort of world? And I think that it's not so much a question of the show avoiding it or trying to please every single fan because you can't you you can't be a people pleaser. Mm. So there there will be people that will be disgruntled and there will be people that will remain unsatisfied. Also because um my interpretation of Tolkien's work will not necessarily be that of Amazon Studios and for example I I don't know, thinking about uh, Peter Jackson's um, films, I can say that I personally still have not gone over the, gotten over the fact that I did not like the way they portrayed Faramir. For me, Faramir was a different type of person, a different type of character. So there's always going to be that sort of insatisfaction. But it is important to deal with these things and not shy away from them and say, yes, we are conscious and we are aware that all of these issues are going to come up and we're going to take at them bravely and responsibly because the i think the legacy of tolkien's work demands us to do it we are responsible now and i think that that's huge to bring that out there into the world it entails a huge responsibility not only from the creators but from the fans that are addressing this so also from the fans that are you know sort of like in this very, I would say, visceral reaction to the cast and the nudity and stuff like that. I also um, think that we should ask ourselves, how are we, are we behaving responsibly in our reactions to the material by spouting that out into the world and online and on the internet? I think that that's also something that we need to reflect on. Yeah, and responsibility of uh, we influencers talking about this topic as well, I think is important. Um, and this is one of the reasons I wanted to have you all on and talk about this is because I, I did want to talk about this nudity and uh, the, the issue of, of having sex in the in the Amazon show. Um, there's been reporting on on this for some time now, and this this isn't an attack on anyone specifically, but a lot of this did come out from the one ring originally um and i was i i have no particular sort of agenda here i like the one ring in general i think they do a good job um, of representing the fandom but um i was a little bit dismayed by the way that they um kind of presented the news um in a slightly sensationalist way that they'd hired a, an intimacy coordinator on the show um and the reason being they didn't they didn't explain what an intimacy coordinator is and the thing is it would be because i know what that that role entails and what it's for it would be stranger if they didn't hire somebody to do that role um and it's it's really a non-issue <laughs> it's a non sequitur um an intimacy coordinator is somebody who is hired in order to um kind of maintain the well-being of the actors um the consent of the actors in any portrayal of any scene of intimacy whether it's a graphic orgy which seems to be some people's fears is that this is going to be game of thrones 2.0 we don't know that <laughs> we don't know that that's what's happening all we know is that there's going to be some kind of intimacy in the show, which, of course, there's going to be some kind of romance. So there's going to be betrayals of intimacy. There's going to be kissing. There's going to be there's men and women, beautiful men and women have been cast in this show. I think we all want to see humans acting like human beings. And I find it in incredible that this has become such a, a hot button issue in the fandom. Um, and I, th I think the Tolkien fandom is fairly healthy. I think it's a healthy fandom where there's not a lot of toxicity. But this issue, I think, has been blown out of proportion a little bit. Um, I'm glad to hear you say that. <laughs> when you, you emailed us and said that was a thing you wanted to talk about, I was like, aren't we done with this yet? Like exactly as you said well, I, uh, I wanted to i wanted to give myself a platform to say that because somebody yeah. needs to, somebody needs to be saying it yeah it's, i think was, i mean i think speculation is fine if we want to talk about if there's sex and nudity how do you think that'll go down like that's a whole separate topic and i think we all know what our reactions would be to that but the whole fact that they've hired an intimacy coordinator and it, it was speculated in the casting that you need to be comfortable with nudity okay you know that doesn't mean there's going to be an orgy 
So I mean, Harry will, will uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, but the the thing about the um, being um, comfortable with nudity, we don't know for a fact that that is. I think it's come out that that is hundred percent not for the Lord of the Rings show. That the, right. on that list, there was only about three things actually for because during that time, I think there was like five or six shows in Auckland and that area filming. So I believe it was for Cowboy Beep. I'm not sure, but I can confirm that is not that none of that is. I think and when the one ring net did say that they probably didn't research it properly, just like a lot of the things they've done recently. I'm not saying that in the mean way, but it's true because. For example, if you ask someone over the last year, what is it's just a normal person who doesn't know doesn't know talking now, or just just watch the Lord of the Rings films and maybe The Hobbit, and you're gonna ask them, and maybe just look in the news a bit, and you ask them from this year, what have you know about the Lord of the Rings show? I bet you most people say, oh, wasn't there nudity and sex, and isn't there going to be nudity and sex, and that's going to be the first thing, and maybe I'm not angry at one ring in there because then this spread quickly into larger articles that i saw for example the independent in the uk the guardian were talking about it but unfortunately their source was the one ring.net and the one ring.net source was false Same and was vision. incorrect and it's just one big misunderstanding which is unfortunately as i went back to earlier you spend a billion on the show you want it to be great you don't want hardly any controversy around it and you have this specific part of the fandom a bit overreact and now there's all this controversy of the show but then this is where i think amazon's had a problem as well why didn't they come out and talk about it it's, it would be so easy just to just that hush and i and the reason that i'll probably be throwing a curveball in here right now is but i i'm not sure if these records are public or not i think it might be but when they were casting in february or january for extras they were asking for people to wear quote sheer clothing so i don't think i think that is the main evidence like if you were arguing about nudity being in the show you would go to that point that they 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 has i have seen it myself that they are looking for extras to wear sheer clothing and sheer clothing could mean a anything but it looks like that they want extras to wear clothes that maybe maybe be a bit see-through for example and i believe that that is the main evidence suggests that we might see a little bit of no maybe not even nudity just maybe just i don't even know how to put it just a bit more it's a bit more out there with like the the actors and actresses so yeah that <clears> shit <throat> the main thing i don't think that's been talked about enough so yeah yeah and dan kind of what you were saying before earlier too of like it and then and harry exactly it's just reflecting poorly on amazon that there's not other stuff for us to talk about you know like mm. i'm kind of at the point where like if if you released anything else we wouldn't focus so heavily on this misunderstanding and flawed research but because it's a thing that could be divisive and can be really reactionary to to so many people especially you know Tolkien was known as a devout Catholic. It's coming from a very Christian background. One of the showrunners is a practicing Mormon. Like there's a lot wrapped up in this that I think has just added to the speculation that doesn't help. And if there was something else to focus on, we wouldn't spend so much time on this. No. But then yeah. again, I, I think like, I agree to a certain extent, but then again, I think it's also the responsibility of the influencers and the fans to try to turn this conversation beyond the sensationalism of am i going to see nudity a la game of thrones in it and also question for example the fact of at the end of the day why is it so problematic that there might be nudity and sexual content in a series based on middle earth is it because it seems to betray the source material and with it, this idea or image that we have of Tolkien as a devout Catholic, or is it because it's basically touching a sensible spot for those who have such a visceral reaction to it? And I think I that- think they just Yeah, I think they just wanna feed on that visceral reaction. We don't know, you know I mean? I imagine if they show it, it's gonna be so tastefully done and really incorporated into the world that you know a random butt cheek is not gonna throw anybody off the story. But exactly as you said, it's just, there's so much that we don't know. Like the speculation is, is more detrimental than the facts. Yeah. And there, but, is, and there, is, nudity, there is nudity in the text as well. So, I exactly. mean, um, not very much of it, but 
you know, when when the hobbits come out of the barrow, when Tom Bombadil rescues them, he strips them naked and tells them to go running around naked on the grass for a little while. Yeah, because they were like you'll, you'll, they, you'll feel better. <laughs> yeah, they were their clothes, like the the clothes that they were taken for the season, had been stolen, and now they mm. only have their warmest clothes. And then you are them frolicking in the grass as God, whatever hobbit God brought them to Middle Earth. Yeah. <laughs> But at the same time, it's like, I, I think it's also the responsibility of those who feel so deeply offended by that possibility to also reflect on why are you feeling so so betrayed, so to speak. Yeah. And the other thing is that, for example, it has been a constant criticism ever since um, The Lord of the Rings was published, that it was within the literature of the 20th century, that it was devoid of sexual content. But I also think that The Lord of the Rings teaches us that it isn't, you don't necessarily need to have um, sexuality to create a masterpiece. Hmm. Not to say that it isn't in there in one way or another. Um, and for example, if you think about uh, other situations like the Silmarillion, where Hmm. Tolkien quite says, like quite explicitly says that as Luthien was dancing in front of Morgoth, he lost it after her. Like, mm -hmm. there it is. Um, so I, I don't know. I, I think hmm. well, there's, I, a, there's a bit of a strong sexual theme with Arathel and Aeol yeah. the Dark Elf as well, though. Isn't and, there? It's, just... it's a real world. Like, there's going to be yeah. sexual themes in it. And hmm. if you think about a character such as Sauron, one of the main features of Sauron was that he was so beautiful and he was seductive. He's a seducer and that's how he obtained so much power. And there has to be that component. And I don't know, I, I, my personal hot take, if somebody asks me is as a scholar and as a fan, I don't necessarily worry about it what i would ask is if there is nudity and there is sexual content i want it because the narrative that they're developing demands it. it is necessary for the development of a good story that the story that you're telling me flows naturally and part of that includes nudity and sexuality in a way if that's the case fine so be it then let it happen but if it's just for the sake of clicks for the sake of making a popular series, then, well, it, it it's just going to be like any other series that does that. And we've seen a thousand in fantasy media, so. Hmm. Yeah, but I believe it's the intentions of Amazon, which is the problem with nudity and sex. As you touched on, Mariana, we, right now in the fantasy genre, it is, it seems like, when you the showrunners make a show we need to have nudity and sex in it for example we go back to game of thrones then what about the witcher oh we have vikings we have that as well oh what about um the last the kingdom the witcher in the in the source material in the text is very sexual <laughs> very yeah, it is very sexual but i just believe is that if, for example in the last kingdom as well in many of them it seems like right now you need to have nudity and sex in order to um to entice viewers in and maybe is Amazon's job to maybe break this trend recently, but at the same time, they may go along with it. But I just believe with New Teen Sex, it's the intention of Amazon and how they want to do it. Do they want to put in there, enhance the story? Okay, then if New Teen Sex enhances the story and makes sense, so be it. If it's, oh, I see a random tip there for no reason, oh, is that just because you want to get extra more viewers in it just depends how amazon takes on the new t how they want to portray new t and sex and if they do have true intentions with it but of course it's always open to interpretation and i think we're suffering by comparison you know there's it's always compared to game of thrones and the witcher and you know i mean all these things have been so popular in the last few years which is great for the genre you know it's great to see fantasy finally making mainstream and being able to be adapted and, and have a wider audience but i we don't know so assuming that it's going to have the same level of sexuality as game of thrones and witcher is not a safe assumption and if this is the information we have to go off i think people are just jumping exactly as you said mariana if the story warrants it great it, it should be there to further a story if it's gratuitous we're gonna know and that's gonna devalue the rest of your story it's yeah, just obvious it's in there for gratuity yeah and anyway like this is my hope 
you know, if, let's say for the sake of argument that they do a terrible job, hearts will be broken. It's gonna be a sad day for Tolkien fandom, but we'll survive. And there will be a new interpretation and a new adaptation. And mm -hmm. it's okay, it's not the end of the world. We survived so, Rankin Bass, didn't we? So Yeah. <laughs> it's one well, creative team of interpretation. We we survived I, I'm sorry to say this, guys. We survived the Hobbit. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we survived because we have at the end of the day, for example, with Star Wars, they might say if something bad comes out they may not survive all the time and some of the other things both Tolkien is okay if Amazon has a bad show we survive because we have Tolkien we have it yeah. all written down it's if, Amazon's if, fault if it gets yeah. mucked up Amazon's fault it's not Tolkien's yeah. fault if you don't like the show re read Silmarillion or the Unfinished Tales go if you're feeling sad go through Tolkien's right Tolkien's yeah. letters and see what he would have thought and just go through that. So that's why no matter how bad Amazon make it we still have Tolkien at the end of the day so it's not really but the only thing people will think is in 50, 100 years time, when we review Tolkien again, will people think of his primary works? Or I think of that billion dollar Amazon show, which had lots of frailties. But that's a discussion that we obviously can't have today because we are not in the future, unfortunately. Well, it's probably all going to kind of mush together as, as these adaptations do. But that's one of the things I love about adaptation, that you're drawing on all these different resources of creativity and interpretation that I'm I'm still really optimistic. You know, if we get a almost billion dollar adaptation of our favorite text, well, this is going to be fun. I'm probably going to roll my eyes and scoff at a lot of it, but it's certainly going to be fun to spend more time in Middle Earth and see stories I haven't seen before. But I hope they take care of it. And if not, yeah, we'll carry on. We'll go on to the next adaptation. Oh, there'll, yeah. def there'll, there'll definitely be things that we'll we'll kind of look at with a, a skeptical eye. I'm, I'm sure. I mean, I love the Peter Jackson trilogy, the original, the Lord of the Rings trilogy. I think it's they're great movies. But the like the the epilogue, the prologue scene where uh, Sauron, um, like the, the very first scene that you see of Sauron um, losing the ring um, and Isildur cutting the ring from his hand. I don't like that scene. <laughs> it makes me laugh every time I see it when Sauron stretches his hand out gradually, like in slow motion. And mm. I just, I just think, what are you doing, Sauron? <laughs> this isn't, this isn't what's in the book. And and I, every time I see that scene, I laugh because I think that it just looks silly that he's stretching his hand out in slow motion. Um, so there will be little things like that that will yeah. pick apart, and there'll be fun discussions to have when when we get there. But yeah. it's, not, it's not going to ruin the show if there's little things like that um and and also like let's not forget the the millions and millions of fans who have been prolifically dedicated themselves to writing fan fiction and yeah. i think that there there has to be some sort of recognition for them who basically have been pushing the boundary to also reimagine Tolkien um in ways that you know it's completely unorthodox and different and alternative and i think that also if Regardless of the success or failure of these series, I am pretty sure that also in the realm of fan fiction, there's um, it's a bountiful well from which to draw inspiration as to um, other adaptations and interpretations of the text. And personally, what this series also makes me hopeful for is I have wanted my entire life for a series dedicated to the curse of Theanor. So. If, if this is tentatively the first step putting us into the direction of the Silmarillion someday being cinematically adapted, I'm all for it. I cannot wait to one day be able to see Feanor on the screen. I know it's very difficult because we all know about the rights, mm -hmm. but you know, a girl can hope. No, I, don't think, I think I don't one day think it will happen. I believe that is closer than you think, because what I think of Amazon is, do you spend 250 million on rights? You have shown you beat Hulu, you beat HBO, you beat Netflix, and they similar offers, but you chose Amazon because when the people who were pitching it to um, to the talking state had nearly encyclopedic knowledge. I believe her name is Helen Shang, had nearly encyclopedic knowledge of Tolkien. If you impress with, if you impress the talking state with this show. And then you, there's another spin-off show. 
you buy more rights, talk estate will give Amazon more rights. And we know, I think this summer reading expires in 2077, uh, quote me on that, I'm not quite sure. But around that time, Amazon could potentially, if the show is a success, and they are keeping towards Emmanuel's Tolkien and the and the Tolkien estate do quite like. Because if you didn't see the contract that um, I think was released recently for the Lord of the Rings game that came out, the Tolkien estate were really strict, and they there were lots of different moral codes as morals stuff like that. They they are quite strict, even though of sadly with Christopher Tolkien's passing, I believe that in the Tolkien estate there are still some firm figures in there who want yeah. to. Preserve Tolkien's legacy, and if Amazon are successful, yeah, the show Priscilla is still alive and well, isn't she? She's yeah. If in about 10 15 years' time we have the sequel show come out, Amazon might say, We trust Amazon, here's here's the silver really, and instead of waiting to 2077, and then we might see finally all these stories. And also, before that, I believe we'll see another re adaptation of The Lord of the Rings in a TV show format. I believe Amazon would do that, but that's my opinion. But back to you, you wanting Feanor, I believe is not as far as some people may think and hopefully we just have to hope wait and see and hope that this show is a success hmm yeah i for one i would love to see the silmarillion adapted too um i think it, it deserves to be um i think you can do it now i think i think 20 30 years ago it would have been unfilmable i don't think it is anymore um it, it needs to be a tv show adaptation though there's no yeah. way it would work as a movie yeah <laughs> um if yeah, they spend this much on rights and they have this amount of resource and support for additional merchandising around it, as Amazon obviously does, they would be mad to not develop other stories alongside. I'm sure there are other things in development, even if in nascent stages. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We'll see. I mean, think of it like Star Wars with Disney Plus. Uh, you know, we've got Mandalorian, we've got you know all these other things that are just starting to come out of the woodworks that are tiny storylines, but they all started from somebody saying, "Hey, I've got an idea, and we have the rights." So I'm, I'm sure there's teams that are already thinking about where we can go with that, especially if there's a time crunch and a significant paycheck has been signed for it. The Angmar Wars could be a great TV show mm -hmm. adaptation, seeing those different, with an army of like Cardin, all these different places, we call that political aspect, them all splitting up, then you see back in Gondor, then you have Angmar as well, with the Witch King fighting due to Sauron's orders, it would be a great TV show adaptation. And there's so yeah. many... Roots. And it's quite interesting because this is my personal opinion. I believe Prime Eregion in the Second Age is one of the best times in fantasy in general. Seeing all these different traits, we see Linden, we see we see Kazadum, we see Lothlodian as well, all working together. And just hopefully Amos will show this Prime Eregion as well. And then maybe we might cut over to Numenor for a bit as well. But I believe it's interesting that they did choose this area of the Second Age because for the first two weeks, Amazon drafted a whole Aragon show, just like briefly, just that Tales of Aragon. But I believe if we were getting a Tales of Aragon show right now, if it's prequel, cool, would we necessarily be doing all these conversations like this? Because it wouldn't be, even though it'd be interesting to see, it wouldn't be as interesting, would it? Because now we're set in us, we are set in a whole age. And I believe it's, this is not a quest. The second age isn't a quest, it's a setting. And that's the difference with TV shows. We're in a setting now. We're no longer in, okay, we need to 100% get this done. We have to have this happen, that happen. We can stray off a bit. We may be able to see, go see Orifer, Orifer in Mirkwood. We never know. I think that's the great thing about the show is that we are in a setting and we can, and we don't have to be restricted to one specific storyline. Because of given course, it's a lot of room for, for yeah, creative kind of exactly. um, room to. to reinterpret whatever plot they want in in that setting because you're right it's more of a setting than a story that they're adapting because mm -hmm. um, the Tolkien estate did say <laughs> you have to stick you can't um contradict what Tolkien with the second age you have to keep to the i think the quote keep to the main beats of the second age but maybe mm. seeing going remember, as i say going off to Arthur, that's not contradicting law Arthur and thrandul were around during the second age that that would be fine to show that in the show and there's so many different options that they could go for, and which is why I think it would be a great show. Yeah, partly that came from Tom Shippey when he was talking about this. Um, he, he he suggested that uh, they could show kind of the untold story of Sauron in the first thousand years of the Second Age, which I think was his example, um, which wouldn't terribly interest me necessarily, but it could be good. It could 
could be interesting. Um, he, so I wanted to ask about Tom Shippey, actually. What were our thoughts on that? Because that's another controversy that people bring up, um, is that he left the production. We know that he's not working on it anymore. We don't know why. We don't, we don't know whether he just finished working on it. Um, mm-hmm. or he's a 77-year-old man, just first off, say. He, is, he, is, yeah. he does not have to be in New Zealand and in there for three years as long as he wants. I believe that in 2018, when he was mainly there, he did his work. He it was done. They got the maps out. They got the video out, and they and I believe he helped with the first season. Then you have to go. There's I think I believe again we have to go back. Unfortunately, the one ring there, they were making us out making it out like he has to be there every single week. He has to be on set. You he has to make sure that I don't know the the the, the um, forest looked correct. I know some small, small things like that, and I believe that he probably did all his work he's done. And of course, I think Corey Olsen was the one who did say that um, they they have parted ways, but it wasn't necessary for Thomas Shippey to be on for the entire show. And maybe and that's oh, yeah, go on. Yeah, I was just gonna say, say and like, and there's again no facts this is all speculation so like yeah. the fact is that he's done working whether there was any animosity we don't know because nobody's come out with a statement if there was some sort of a statement saying thanks so much tom really helpful having you on set love working with mm-hmm. you great we know he's done and it's a positive thing the absence of a statement i think makes people assume yeah. that something negative happened and that's problematic so it's a shame but i'm i'm with you harry that you need Tom Shippey for the consulting at the beginning to develop detailed scripts and and maps and all of these things that require a significant amount of mm-hmm. research. We don't have that anymore. Um, maybe come second season, there might be a bit more of that. But that's what the Tolkien State does. And if there's any, you know, one throw off comments, then you could email Tom Shippey. Like, you know, there's things that don't require yeah. him to be an integral part of the day to day. Mm-hmm. And also, like, for example, we don't necessarily know to what extent, like, I think we we also have to remember that we are not over this pandemic. And this has also changed mm-hmm. and stalled a lot of the things that have going on with the show. So I think that also as, as a public, we can't necessarily expect for all of our questions and demands to be fulfilled, especially in these times. And if he's a 77-year-old man, why would he need to be in New Zealand right now in this specific time. Like Precisely. Anyway. I would rather and, he wasn't. I want him to write more books. So And at the same time, I also think that for example, Tom Sheppy, like he represents an establishment in Tolkien scholarship and in the way of t- interpreting Tolkien. Hmm. But he's not the only Tolkien scholar. Yeah. So and his views have been part of a conversation that just keeps getting richer and more diverse we don't know who else is also aiding um amazon studios regarding uh this adaptation and i'm just putting it out there to say i think tom shippy is capable of doing a great job i consider him more of a traditionalist more old school regarding his interpretations on tolkien but i don't think that he should necessarily be the only voice to be consulted um, just because uh, Tolkien scholarship has been changing also in the past 20 years. So he probably did a good job and there will be other consultants just as valid as he is and probably addressing other issues and other concerns within the series. So now look at what we're doing right now as prime example. Maybe Tom Shippey, even though he might be older, I'm sure he can know how Zoom works. He could, they could be doing the, the writers who could be doing exactly what we're doing right now, having discussions like this and planning stuff out, which which does really, I think, hush down all the speculation about Tom Shippey leaving the production. And also, as um Mariana was mentioning, you don't need of you don't only need Thomas Thomas Shippey. That I'm sure even if you're not a qualified Tolkien professor, I'm sure the people on set who know Tolkien inside out, there's lots of people you can rely on as well. It doesn't have to be the signature. Maybe, for example, Corey Olsen or Thomas Shippey. Maybe even one of us. Could, we could do, I'm sure all our talking knowledge is at a, at a decent level. We could all put a shift in sometimes. Maybe, of course, not to level like consulting wise, but like if they need help on law, example, there are people out there that doesn't have to just always be Thomas Shippey or, as said, Corey Olsen, etc. 
Part of that, though, was attaching their wagon to that name. So I think they were mm -hmm. using Tom Shippey and Corey Olson as, don't worry, fans, we've got it covered. We've got this trusted dude, you know? Um, I think the big thing we're missing out here is that production is in process, if not already finished. Um, mm -hmm. You don't need anything else now. The scripts are done. The people that are making the film were not involved in the creative development for the most part, except for the top tier people that are on set. Like, the work has been put into it, and then we put that work into practice so once you're on set like i mean i remember when i was working on twilight i was asking about this do you refer back to the original text do you bring the author in no we've already done all that this is where we put it into play that's that's the purpose of of production so probably just done you know i would like to think that that's what it is but it would be nice if amazon would just tell us yeah. like, thanks tom mm. high five move on and i also like to say that season two scripts are done they've been done since july august so they would probably, if they wanted Tommy Shippey back, it would probably be 18 months to two yeah. years when they need him again for season three scripts. But I believe as we are throughout this podcast, the main thing that we're coming back to is miscommunication. Oh, we don't know what's happening with Tommy Shippey. But the fans don't know. But then the fans are going to start speculating, which is not going to look good for Amazon. But then it's just a, it's a triangle, consumer, and then the people who make a producer, and then you've and got the media as well. The golden and this is triangle. that issue with that, that disconnect mm -hmm. between creator and fan. It's just so much more problem, or can be so much more problematic than I think creators assume. They think, I'll oh, just ignore it, it'll be quiet. It's You can use it so much to your power if you engage with fandom. You'll make so much more money if you engage with <laughs> fandom in a careful way. And I feel like that's still a missed trick in a lot of industry circles. But how aware are they of conversations like this that are happening in the fandom? I mean, they're presumably they're watching they're watching what's happening, the discussions that are happening online. I mean, I don't know this one specific one, but I mean, sure, industry's changed a fair bit in the last 15, 20 years with the advent of interactive internet and things like that. You know, they have to react a lot faster. There's usually teams that are reactive. So if something blows up in the fandom, if something is leaked, you know, it's their job to find it in minutes and shut it down. That's kind of a given, but that's more of like a control of information and a legality type thing in terms of PR. I think it's been absorbed into a lot of PR departments and Harry, you can probably comment on your experience with it, but, I can't, it's, but... it's more, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's more of like, I don't know. It, it doesn't have the nuance that I think it needs for what the fans have access to now, the power, the knowledge, the organization, you know, petitions are organized at the drop of a hat. Research is, is done really quickly to negate whatever you just said on a live interview and therefore undermine your authority on that project. It's so much more powerful than I think industry is expecting or is prepared for. That being said, some are very aware of it. So when you have teams in place that are very aware of it and work with the fandoms and keep them on side, you have like in, in the fandom, there's just so many different ways you can kind of negate that negative reaction. And if they're not doing it, they're missing a trick. Yeah, so it doesn't feel like Amazon's doing it. I would love to be proved wrong, but we haven't that. really had that yet. I know the caster, and I don't want to sound arrogant or gloat or anything, but I have been told by some people that the cast do watch some of my videos. And I'm allowed to say this, that, for example, I, Morphe Clark messaged me and told me off for her um, pronunciation of her name. Because I was saying more Clark, Morphe Clarks. And then, yeah, for example, and I remember with Simon Morellas, we were having talks about Brexit. It and some cast I know that some people do I think the cast are quite um interactive but is I think they are so restricted and they're under so many probably contracts and NDAs and stuff like that that I believe at this current time it's hard to interact. And I'm not sure who would dish that out, all these strict NDAs and and I believe that for right now people are confused about Amazon's um what they're doing right now and how and their take on stuff and how they actually interact with fans. And I think if that we forget past that barrier, then we can go much further. Cool. All right, I'm going to wrap things up now. Um, so thank you all for coming on. Um, I'm going to go around clockwise and just ask you where people can find you and what you're working on. So um, starting with, with Maggie. Where you can find me, I live in North mm -hmm. Wales. Don't please come to my house. Well, um, I, no, <laughs> no. Um, I am on Twitter, but I tend to be more reactive than proactive. So I would just say if, if you're interested in, in more, check out Signum University's courses. Um, you can also go to maggiepark.com. Um, and that's where all my like professionally worky stuff is. But 
this is the more fun stuff. So I would just engage with anything I do online. What I'm currently working on, um, I've been redeveloping a bunch of courses for a couple of different universities. Um, basically, Mariana, this will appeal to you to incorporate diversity into the curriculum. Um, so taking old Harry Potter courses, because you can't just teach Harry Potter flat anymore. It needs to refer to the things that are happening in the world. So rewriting a couple of courses. Um, and I am actually working on finally turning my thesis into a book. So well, it's a sloth, but it's happening. <laughs> <laughs> um so yeah uh i'm just i'm i'm about to teach next semester so this is this is the life of a postgraduate student of a phd student so um, i'm about to teach next semester and i'm finishing i'm going to i'm in my third year of phd studies and um so basically what i do is looking at how the feminine characters in Tolkien's Middle Earth narrative. So I'm looking at the Hobbit, the Lord of the Rings, and the Silmarillion, how they construct their own ethos. And I'm grounding my idea of ethics and the other on the works of a French philosopher called Emmanuel Levinas. So that is what I am currently working on. At the same time, um, close collaboration with the Center for Fantasy and the Fantastic at the University of Glasgow. It's, um, I would highly, um, encourage people to reach out to us. Um, we have uh, monthly events, more or less, monthly, bi-monthly events. Um, for Christmas, we had an event of um, ghost stories um, regarding Christmas, that sort of uh, that um, Victorian tradition. And I believe next year, I hope I'm not um, leaking anything, um, I believe next year there will be an event uh, related to D&D. &D. So that should be a lot of fun. Um, people can find me on Twitter. Um, it's just my name, Mariana Rios Mal One. That's my Twitter handle. Um, also known as Witch Queen of Angmar, which I'm sure there's a lot of Witch Queens of Angmar on Twitter, but yeah. I'm one. Okay? Bitch Queen. Um, yeah, and uh, that, that's basically me. Um, the only thing that I would like to end, um, I just would like to end with a very brief reflection. And this is something that came, something that came to my mind when um, I was trying to put my thoughts on paper about this. And I'm saying this because of how personal and important for me representation is. And talking to a lot of fans that have felt that this is a subject that needs to be addressed um, in fandom and also in academia regarding science fiction and fantasy. And one of the things that I'd like to just highlight and, and my, you know, this this wonderful talk that I've had with all three of you, and I thank you for, for the opportunity and for your time. It's been amazing. Um, is that one of the key lessons of the Lord of the Rings specifically is the importance of change. So if you think about it, this is Tolkien's greatest work, the Lord of the Rings, but he doesn't show us a world at the height of its grandeur. He shows us a moment of transition, of change. And I think that that's something that needs to stick with us. Why would Tolkien want to portray that? Not the splendor, the change. And so I believe that what he teaches us through his text is that change is necessary. It's painful, it's hard, it's difficult but it is important in order for things to be rediscovered and seen anew and for new things to come about and to flourish. And I think that the possibilities and the opportunities that are being offered to us through a show like this, with the new interpretation, with a diverse cast, is part of that process of change that is at the heart of a text like Lord of the Rings. And it is precisely addressing that message of hope and courage that has touched so many people from so many different places and languages and cultures around the world. And I just want people to think about that. And if we are disappointed, we're disappointed. But if not, this could be the beginning of something big, capable of encompassing everybody who loves Tolkien today. Perfect. Thank you for that. That's a really good note to end on. Um, <laughs> thank you for coming on as well. And Harry? Unlike the two wonderful educated guests on my right, I am just a simple YouTuber. You can find me on YouTube, Fellowship of Fans, and I'm also on Twitter and on Instagram 
I I do lo some law videos. I do lots of work on the Lord of the Rings on Prime, and also can be maybe called a source as well as now. Can't explain into too many details why, but thank you for having me on here, Dan, also Voice of Geek Tim. I really appreciate it, and I appreciate all the other guests. So it's been a really interesting conversation, and seeing so many different but also same viewpoints at the same time really leads to a really good discussion. So thank you. Great. And hopefully it gives everybody an opportunity to take a breath. I think that's kind of always my purpose with this discussion on adaptation. Just take a breath. It's going to be okay. You know, we can <laughs> we can enjoy other people's opinions and perspectives and hopefully enjoy the adaptation once it comes. Take it with a grain of salt. Try to leave your pitchfork at home. You know, exactly. enjoy what you can out of it. So thanks, guys. I appreciate it. Pitchfork and tiki torch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, hopefully we can have some more discussions in the future when we can have more to talk about, which God knows when that will be. But um, thank you all for coming on. Um, I will be back with more Silmarillion content. I've got uh, Chapter 11 coming up, which may well be out before this podcast comes out um, of the Silmarillion. I'm going through chapter by chapter. Um, and I'm going to be launching a new series on the channel on Numenor. So I'm going to be focusing on Numenorean history um, going through from the establishment of the island, like the colonization of the island by the first age of Dine, Elros, uh, King Tarminyata, um, will be the first uh, sort of chapter of that series. And I'll be going through that whole kind of story from start to finish. Um, similar to what I do with the Silmarillion, except for I won't be focusing quite as much on the text because there isn't as much to focus on. So I'll be talking about that history and, and talking about what we know about it. Um, on the channel next year alongside the Silmarillion series which will be continuing um, and this podcast so uh, there's going to be lots more content coming out on on Voice of Geekdom so stay tuned for all of that but yeah um, thank you everybody for coming on and uh, thank you for your time and goodbye <laughs>